Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the worship service. I know you've been there. You ought to have been there from the very beginning. I will thank the Lord because of those of us who are diligent, and those of us who are determined, and those of us who really desire to worship the Lord, that you do as if you were at the sanctuary. Because where you are is a sanctuary. And you are worshipping the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Worshipping the Lord in truth and in spirit. Once again, I appreciate that you are there. And the Lord himself will make his word enrich your life. And the grace of God will be in your life. And you will work on what you are hearing. You will be the better for it in Jesus' name. We are praying together now. Father, we thank you for this worship. And we bless your name because of what you've done already and what you keep on doing. I'm asking, Lord, for everyone connecting today in their homes, in the local churches, on online, everywhere. I pray that your grace will abound in every life more and more in Jesus' name. Be glorified today in every life. And help us, Lord, as we worship you to exalt the Lord to obey your word, and to give ourselves completely without reservation unto you. In Jesus' name, we thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Today, as you have noticed, we have done a search the scripture. I hope you were there at a time of searching the scriptures together. And we studied Psalm 10, Psalm 11, Psalm 12, and Psalm 13. Quite a lot were covered. And what we are going to do today is to look at all those Psalms, Psalm 10, Psalm 11, Psalm 12, and then Psalm 13, and see what the Lord is telling us today. But I'm going to start with just verse 3 of Psalm 11. Psalm 11, we're looking at verse 3. It says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Underline that in your Bible. In fact, you need to memorize that. And every turn of the way, at every crossroad, you are remembering. Foundation, foundation, foundation. Foundation is very important. The foundation of your faith, very important. And the foundation of your family, very important. And the foundation of the flock, that is the people who are worshipping the Lord, very important. And the foundation of faithfulness, as we are faithfully following the Lord and serving the Lord, how important the foundations are. And it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let me tell you something very important in your personal life. There is nobody who can destroy the foundation if you do not allow that. In your family, there is nobody who can destroy the foundation of your family if you don't allow that. In the local church, in the flock of God, among the people of God, a pastor, there is no one that can destroy the foundation of that church and of the church of God if you don't allow it. I'm going to show you something in Jeremiah chapter 12. In Jeremiah chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 10. Jeremiah chapter 12, we're looking at verse 10. It says, many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. You see that? It is the local pastor himself. It's the district pastor himself. It's the group pastor himself. It's the region pastor himself. It's the state pastor himself that can destroy the foundation. If we become negligent, you see, you have to keep that foundation. It says many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden down my portion underfoot. Pastors, shepherds, and leaders who are supposed to maintain the foundation. You know, in your family, as the head of the family, as the husband, as the father, over your children, over your family, you have to maintain the foundation. It says there's many pastors who have destroyed my, my vineyard. They have trodden my portion on the porch. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. And look at verse 11 there. It says in verse 11, they have made it desolate. They, those pastors, those leaders, they made it desolate. And it mourneth unto me. It cries unto me. It is sorrowful and sad. And it says the whole land is made desolate. Because no man lays it to heart. 
if you don't put the condition of your family in your heart, if you don't put the condition of your face in your heart, if you don't have the condition of everything the Lord has given you at the foundation, if you don't lay that to your heart, it will be destroyed. That's why we're looking at today building an indestructible life on God's preserved foundation. That is your own life, your own family, your Christian life, your Christian profession, and your Christian journey, and your Christian conviction, building that on an indestructible foundation, a preserved foundation. There are three things we're looking at as we look at this subject today. Number one, the enduring preservation of divinely revealed foundations. There are foundations the Lord himself has revealed. And this divinely revealed foundation, we need to preserve, and we need to conserve, and we need to protect, and we do that enduringly, and the enduring preservation of divinely revealed foundations. Point number two, our ensured protection from damnable, regrettable forgetfulness. This, the Psalms tell us that when we forget God, when we forget his word, when we forget our consecration, when we forget our commitment, there is something that happens. That's why the Lord is saying we need to ensure, we need to affirm, we need to so determine that the damnable, forgetful, regrettable forgetfulness will not be in our lives. Number two, our ensured protection from damnable, regrettable forgetfulness. Point number three, our end time pursuit. Our end time pursuit. We're running in a race and we're moving on in the way the Lord wants us to move on and we need to keep on pursuing. You want to get to heaven? You want to make it on the final day and when the trumpet shall sound, you want to be a, a, among the people that will go with the Lord in the rapture. And this is the end time. And we cannot be careless now. We cannot be distracted now. And we cannot allow anything to ruin the foundation that the Lord has established in our lives. Our end time pursuit without distracting ruinous flatteries. Um, you know, in, when you were in school, I'm sure in the literature uh, that you read, you will see in those fables and those stories and the stories that, you know, we read about in our literature books, how you can flatter somebody and then that person is flattered, will forget himself and will drop whatever he has and the precious sin in his hand, in his life, he drops away because of the flattery. And the scripture says a lot about flattery. And it says, at this end time, while we're pursuing the goal, and we're reaching out, and we're aiming for, in what the Lord himself has put in our hands, we must not allow distracting, ruinous flatteries uh, to hinder us from being stable, and being solid, and being observant, and being watchful in what the Lord has given us. Number three, then, our end time pursuit without distracting, ruinous flatteries. Let's come back to point number one. We're looking at Psalm 11 again. In Psalm 11, we're reading from verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Our young people need to understand that worshiping God is not uh, just, uh, you know, just to worship God and just to sing and just to dance and just to have merriment and just to have what, what, what people call fellowship. There must be foundation to our worship. There must be foundation to our belief. There must be a foundation to salvation. There must be foundation in serving the Lord so that by the grace of God we'll get to heaven on the final day. And if the foundations be destroyed, there are many, uh, many children who are thinking, uh, I don't like uh, the church where my parents are going. Uh, you know, it's not active, it is dull, and I want to go to another place where the people are excited and the people can dance and the people are free and the young people can do whatever they want. That's the kind of church I want. It ministers to my emotion and then I can express myself. My son, my daughter, you, you know what? You need to consider whether that thing, that place you we want to go has foundation. What's the foundation? What's the doctrine? 
What's the teaching? Is it based on the Bible? Is it based on the Word of God? Or is it just to entertain the young people? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Look at verse 4. It says in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. If the Lord in his, is in his temple, in the sanctuary, will he allow, will he permit, will he consent to the foundations being destroyed that all we do is superficial, all we do is emotional, all we do is just to satisfy the flesh? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And the foundation of heaven, the foundation of his throne, is not eroded, is not destroyed. In fact, when Lucifer wanted to destroy that foundation, the Lord drove him out with all the fallen angels. The Lord's throne is in heaven. And you know, the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, Thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. As he drove out anyone, everyone that could have destroyed the foundation of his throne in heaven, that's exactly what he wants on earth. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. As we look at, you know, the world, look at Psalm 82. In Psalm 82, I'm reading from verse 5. In Psalm 82 verse 5, it talks about the foundation of the world. Look at, you know, the, the people of the world. In fact, the world will tell you that things are not the same today as they were a century ago, a hundred years ago, or two thousand years ago. Why? Look at this, Psalm 82, reading from verse 5. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Look at all the establishments in the world and look at all the, all the companies in the world and look at the various countries in the world and look at what the people of the world are doing, how they govern, how they lead, how they do this and that. You will see there are people that are even who should be protecting the foundation, the constitution of the various countries, of the various nations, but they walk on in darkness. And it says all the foundations of the earth are out of course. In fact, people are telling us now that with the pandemic on, after the pandemic, they say things are not going to be the same anymore. Uh, they are talking about, you know, people taking laws into their hands and people behaving, acting anyhow, and people overlooking and neglecting the foundation, and there's no principle anymore. They say things are going to be different. They say, you elderly people, just look away. Don't, don't look at, you know, what the other people are doing, because freedom is going to be more, and hooliganism and crime, everything is going to be more than ever before, because People are going to be walking without foundation. But the Lord is telling us, if we aim to serve the Lord, if we aim to remain with the Lord, we must have enduring preservation of the divinely revealed foundation. Even though the foundations of the world and the foundation of the earth, all of them are getting out of course, we will stand and we will remain to preserve the foundation of the Lord. Can I show you three things as we talk about the enduring preservation of divinely revealed foundation? Number one is the comprehension, the understanding of God's indestructible foundations. The comprehension of God's indestructible foundations. When we talk about foundation, what are we talking about? When we refer to foundation, what are we talking about? I want you to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 10. I thank you, God bless you. You're opening your Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, 
according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise apostle. Master Builder, an apostle is supposed to build, build the lives of people on the foundation of the word of God. According to the grace which is given unto me as a wise prophet of God. And you build the lives of people and the hope of people on the foundation of the prophecies of the word of God as a wise master builder, as a wise evangelist, as a wise pastor, as a wise teacher of the word of God. It says, I have laid the foundation. How can you evangelize without foundation? How can you be a pastor without foundation? How can you be a teacher of the word without foundation? It says, Paul the apostle says, Paul the prophet says, Paul the evangelist says, Paul the pastor teacher says, I have laid the foundation and another builders thereon. Another who comes in another generation, another who comes that is now called and is going to build, he doesn't tamper with the foundation. He builds thereon. He keeps the foundation intact, the foundation of faith, and the foundation of that faith once delivered unto the saints. He keeps everything intact, and he builds thereon. And it says, let every man take heed how he builds thereon. You know, you understand that? As you are building, don't touch the foundation. Don't destroy the foundation. Don't displace the foundation. Don't erode into the foundation. Keep the foundation as God has revealed it unto us. And then he says in verse 11, telling us about the foundation for all the foundation. Can no man live that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know what he's saying? He's saying Jesus is our Savior, is the foundation of our salvation. Jesus is a sanctifier, is the foundation of our sanctification. Jesus is a healer and deliverer, is the foundation of our, our healing and our deliverance. You know there are people that go out as skelter, they're looking for deliverance, and the things you see and the things you hear in those places where they say they have a deliverance ministry, it's actually, they bring in a little occultism, and they bring in a little bit of idolatry, and they bring whatever they bring, and their foundation is no more Christ. And they tell you a lot of things without telling you what Christ has done, and he has taken all our problems away, and it's the answer, it's the solution to all the problems we have, but Paul the Apostle by the Spirit of God says, all that foundation can no man lay. A preacher, no man lay any other foundation. An intercessor, no man will lay any other foundation. And he's, uh, he's a helper, he's a counselor, and he's a healer, he's a deliverance minister, and he's a preacher, he's a pastor. He's an overseer, a GO, or he's a superintendent, a GS. Nobody, GS or GO or pastor or anyone, no man should lay any other foundation for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He says in verse 12, in verse 12 he says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, you understand? If any man, any man is like, another word is whosoever, whosoever, whosoever is going to build, let him preserve that foundation. Build on this foundation. There's no other foundation for salvation, sanctification, and for security, and for stability, and for steadfastness. There's no other foundation in worshiping God. If any man, whatever the name, whatever the title, Whatever the popularity in society and whatever the religious uh, uh, clout around him, around her, if anyone build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, his trouble, as he continues, the fire of judgment will test everyone's building and ministry on that final day. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 12. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, it says that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. When we are without Christ, we are aliens, we are strangers to the commonwealth of Israel. 
to the covenant of God he made with his people were strangers. And it says from the super strangers, from the covenant of promise, having no hope, a person that has not come to Christ, he has not built on the foundation, he has not taken the foundation of faith and the foundation of salvation as Savior, he has no hope. And is without God in the world. In verse 13, it says, in verse 13, it says, But now in Christ, now that we've come away out of darkness into the light, we've come out of sin and come to the Savior, we've come from our past, and we've come now to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were in the past, sometimes far off, a mage nigh, by the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's what he did. And that is what has given us assurance that we can call God Abba Father. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, For he is our peace. He was, he is, he will ever be. There is no other way. And there's no other road. There's no other sacrifice. And there is no other man. There's no other woman. There's no other personality. There is nobody, religious or moral or whatever. And he says, he, Christ and Christ alone, is our peace. Who made, who has made both one. Who has made both one. You know, he makes both one. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. And he makes both one. How? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? The Jew cannot say, I'm a Jew, and I believe in all these animal sacrifices, and I remain the way I am. And then you say you're a Christian, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is making us one. No, not at all. Anyone that is going to be one with Christ, and one with the body of Christ, he will take that same road. A Jew, a Gentile, as somebody born in a religious house or is born outside religion, any religion, if we're going to be one, if there's going to be peace with God and peace with one another, we come through the same way, the same narrow way that leads to heaven and the same way of repentance, the same way of abandoning the past and the same way of abandoning tradition, the same way of abandoning everything of the past and we come to Christ and Christ now has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. In verse 15, it tells us, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, for to make in himself of twain one new man, one new man, as to come to Christ all the old life old religion, old ideology, you abandon that and you leave that outside the gate and you enter in and now when you, when you come, whatever you had in the past, I come, whatever I had in the past, now we forsake everything. Sin, we forsake. Idolatry, we forsake. Religion, religion does not save, we forsake. And then as we all come, without all the baggage of the darkness we had, when we're in the world, we now come into Christ, He cleanses us, He forgives us, He sets us free, and He makes in Himself one twain, one uh, twain, uh, the two of us, or, you know, all of us, Jew, Gentile, everybody, one new man, so making peace, that's how it makes peace. That's how it makes peace. It's not on the conference table. It's not on the basis of compromise. You leave the doctrine of Christ and then we are going to keep on to this and let's come together. And you leave the foundation and we come together. You have to sacrifice something. You sacrifice your conviction. You sacrifice the doctrine, you sacrifice Christ, and you give up the light, and you give up the Bible, and you give us strong conviction, because once you honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints, then there will be no peace. All that contention for the faith will not bring peace. No, you don't abandon the faith. You don't abandon the foundation. 
you abandon your old life, he abandons his old life. You abandon your old religion, he abandons his old religion. You see, Christ is the way. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the Savior. Only through Christ can we get to heaven. That is the foundation. We need to comprehend. We need to understand. And look at, um, look at verse 20 there of that. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 it says, And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. It tells us in um, Hebrews chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. It says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Can I explain that to you? It doesn't say abandon the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What it's saying is, have you completed your course, your studies on uh, um, JSS 1? All right. Leave all that now. That one is settled. Now you can go to GSS 2. You leave what you have done. That one is settled. And that one is, uh, is, is abiding. All the knowledge you add there in GSS 1, you're still going to use in GSS 2. But you are not repeating and repeating and repeating GSS 1 all through your life. And when you go to university, you have already, um, you know, you finished the 100 level. And it says you can leave that now and go to the 200 level. That's what he's saying. It doesn't say abandon the 100 level. Everything you learned there, yeah, that one is secured. All the knowledge is established and the foundation, the principle you have learned in, uh, at a hundred level, you can now take all that, not repeating that every day, not repeating as in class every time, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Let's go higher. Let's build on now. Now he wants to explain what he's talking about, about the principle of the doctrine of Christ, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, that one is settled, that's foundation. And of faith toward God, that one is settled, that's part of the foundation. And then in verse 2, it talks about, in verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That one is settled. And once you are baptized in water, you don't go back again. I want to be baptized the following week and the following month and the following year. And then the baptism in the Holy Ghost. When the Lord in mercy with the Holy Spirit, you are saved. You are baptized in water. You are sanctified. And then you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. It says that's already settled. And of the resurrection of the dead. We believe that already. That when the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise up. And then of eternal judgment. Uh, can I show you something? It said the foundation of the Lord is from the doctrine of repentance. That's the beginning. And then until you have eternal judgment of God. And everything from the beginning, repentance to resurrection at the end, and then everything in between, that is the foundation. Everything you hear about holiness, that's in between that repentance and resurrection. Everything you hear about marriage, one, man, one wife, that's at the foundation. All the things we learn that will become stable Christians, that were not blown here and there by every wind of doctrine, that is the foundation, and it wants us to comprehend and he wants us to abide there. Let's come to number two now. And it is conservation of God's incorruptible foundation. The conservation of God's incorruptible foundation. The foundation of God is as incorruptible as himself. The foundation of Christ is as incorruptible as himself. The foundation Christ as leech. The foundation Christ has put in place. The foundation what Christ preached, the word he preached, his will, he revealed. Everything Christ did is an incorruptible foundation. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. Matthew 
chapter 24, reading from verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away. The world will be shaken. The earth will be shaken. And shall be shaken to the very foundation. But look at this. But my word shall not pass away. My words will have that foundation. The foundation that will abide. The foundation that will remain. It says, but my word is word on repentance. I came not to call the self-righteous. But sinners to repentance, that word shall not pass away. Except a man shall be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That is the word of Christ. It shall not pass away except your righteousness shall exceed, shall go beyond the outward righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. That's the word of Christ. It will not pass away. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That's the words of Christ. And he says, but my word shall not pass away. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. He says, but my word shall not pass away. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He says, bless my word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He says, uh, he says uh, we should tarry in Jerusalem, tarry in our cities, tarry in the sanctuary until ye be endued with power from on high. Because uh, you will have, you receive the Holy Ghost, be baptized in the Holy Ghost, you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and he dwells you and becomes like rivers of living water flowing out of your belly and it says that power that you are to receive so you can be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. It says all those wars they will not pass away. And it says, I'm coming again in my father's house. How many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He said, that will not pass away. He said, now the hour cometh. When the dead shall hear the word of the Son, the voice of the Son of God, the Son of Man, and those who are dead, they will rise up and it says some to everlasting life and some to everlasting content. It says heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away. And then it says there will be the great tribulation. And it says then you will see the son of man and it will come with the clouds of heaven and it says all those words will not pass away. It is the word that is incorruptible. It is the word that is indestructible. And he wants us to abide in all his word. We're not just saying, uh, you know, I just want to worship. I want to go to that fellowship. I want to go to that assembly. All I want is just worship, worship. It's more than that. We must keep to the foundation. If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? In fact, uh, let's look at Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 19. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 19. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Have you seen that there are false prophets and there are false preachers? Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Have you seen the confusion in the land and the confusion of all the way believer? The confusion of, you know, the prophet is saying something we cannot find in the word of God. The um, GS is saying something we cannot find in the word of God. A GO is saying something we cannot find in the word of God. Whatever they say and whatever they preach and whatever they affirm, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, all these uh, things we read about, you know, there is rape and a uh, uh, pastor raped uh, one of their members and this one raped that and raped that and all these uh, things. And then you are not sure again, uh, where's the standard? 
And where is the foundation? What are the qualifications of the people that should be preaching the gospel and serving the Lord? Everything is eroded. Everything is destroyed. But it says men may do whatever they want to do and men may say whatever they want to say. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And you, a child of God, and you, a believer, brother, sister, a son of God, a daughter of God, and you are a preacher of the word of God, it says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, who is that, evangelist, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, who is that, an intercessor, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, who is that, a preacher, a pastor, a shepherd, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, who is that, a generous representative, a general overseer, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, a believer, who says, I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to one to him that believe in him, receive him. He gave power to become the sons of God. Everyone like that, naming the name of Christ as my Savior, naming the name of Christ as my sanctifier, naming the name of Christ as my Redeemer. It says, let everyone, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It says in verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. It says in a great house, that's talking about the church. As we look at the church in our country, large, large church. I'm not talking about single congregation. All the people that put their name as, I'm a Christian, I'm a church goer, I believe in God, I believe in Christ. Large house. And then some are to honor. They are keeping the foundation. They are building on foundation. They are living by the word of God on the foundation. Others are to dishonor. Unfortunately, the percentage of people to dishonor who destroy, the, uh, who destroy the foundation, they are more, they are greater than the percentage of those and so on. And you make the choice for yourself that you'll be a child of honor. You'll be a servant unto honor. You'll be a believer unto honor. If that is going to take place, look at verse 21. In verse 21 it says, If any man, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. The church, the choice is yours. That you will be a believer unto honor, a vessel unto honor, a servant unto honor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. It says in verse 22, it says, flee also youthful laws. Flee youthful laws. Uh, let me talk to our youth again, our young people. Uh, well, you know, you want to run to that assembly, I run to that assembly, because there's freedom there. Freedom to lust, and freedom uh, to commit fornication, and freedom to sin, and freedom to do evil. That's not worshipping God. You are worshipping your flesh. You are worshipping you know, uh, the, the idol of the land. But you know, if you are really going to build on the foundation, you want to get to heaven, and heaven is your goal, heaven is your focus, flee also youthful laws. And of course, uh, adult people too, because when David committed the sin of adultery, he committed, he wasn't a youth, he was, you know, advanced in age, he was already marrying and having children, and yet he had laws. And the Lord is saying, every one of us, a man, a woman, a brother, a sister, a boy, a girl, flee also youthful laws, but follow righteousness, Faith, charity, peace are with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, saved, out of a pure heart, sanctified, out of a pure heart, holy and righteous, out of a pure heart. And now we need to continue. We have seen the comprehension of God's indestructible foundation. And we've seen at the conservation of God's incorruptible foundation. Now we need to continue, continue. Number three now is continuation in God's irreplaceable foundation. There's no other foundation. 
And nobody can replace this one. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost has given to us. It is an irreplaceable foundation. I want you to come to, um, come to Luke chapter 6, continuation. In God's irreplaceable foundation. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say now? The Lord is asking us this question today. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Is going to ask us that same question at the end of life. Is going to ask us that same question when we see him face to face. When you say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done many mighty miracles, works in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not preached and traveled here and there by land, by sea, by air? Have we not done that in your name? Is going to ask everyone that question. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and you did not do the things which I say? He wants us to build on the foundation, abide in the foundation. That's how our work, that's how our ministry, that's how our service will be acceptable in his sight and be rewardable by him. Look at verse 47. It says in verse 47, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sins and doeth them, he heareth, he doeth them. He heareth and doeth them. He listens and he doeth them. He understands and he doeth them. He readeth and he doeth them. I will show you to whom he is like. In verse 48, it says that he is like a man which built a house that is the house of his faith, the house of his worship. The house of his devotion, the house of his service, the house of his family. That is, he built a house and he dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Upon this rock, I built my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And he says, and the rock that followed them was Christ. That is the foundation. You are going to be saved. Christ is the foundation. Sanctified, Christ is the foundation. You are going to worship God, all right? Christ is the foundation. You are going to labor, you are going to serve, you are going to minister. Christ is the foundation. He laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the steam beat vehemently upon that house, could not shake it. Because, for it was founded on a rock. It was built on that irreplaceable foundation. Look at verse 49. In verse 49, But he that heareth and doeth not, he, he reads the Bible, he doesn't obey, he must be born again, he doesn't obey, you must repent, he doesn't obey, Seek the Lord while he may be found. He doesn't obey. Let the wicked forsake his way. He heareth, he readeth, he, he doeth not. He is like a man without a foundation. How many people are just coming to the church? I've learned how to tie scarf. Is that foundation? I've learned how to, you know, do this and do that. I will just uh, join uh, the boss. We didn't start at the beginning of repentance. At the beginning of salvation, the Spirit of God is not bearing witness in your heart that your sins are forgiven and the Lord has set you free by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. I just join, I just join. I don't smoke too much now like I used to. I don't drink too much now like I used to. I don't visit this and visit that. But they are not born again. They have not received Christ as their, as their Lord and Savior. And they are just obeying, trying to be externally uh, the, the doctrine of a church. He that heareth and doeth not, can you tell me the day you are born again? Can you tell me the time uh, the Spirit of God bore witness in your heart 
that your name is written in the book of life in heaven. Can you tell me how Christ is alive in you? I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the face of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. Do you have that definite experience, indisputable experience, undebatable experience of being born again? If you are not born again, you are just building without the foundation of the new birth, without the foundation of salvation, you'll be surprised when it will become too late and you'll put your finger in your mouth and regret because you didn't build on the foundation. Because he that heareth and doeth not, it's like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. I pray you will build and remain, abide on the foundation in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. Amen for your life in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. In point number two is our assured protection from damnable, regrettable forgetfulness. Let's come back, come back to the Psalms. We're looking at Psalm 10 and we're reading from verse 4 now. Psalm 10, reading from verse 4. It says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. Look at this. God is not in all his thoughts. God is not in all his thoughts. Whatever he's thinking, whatever he's planning, God is not part, uh, allow me to use the language, is not part of the equation. It can balance his uh, chemical equation and then you don't find God there and God should be at the beginning, the alpha. God should be at the end, the omega, and the, uh, the alpha and the omega. God should be the one that runs through everything that he does because Christ says, without me ye can do nothing, but God is not in all his thoughts. Is traveling, God is not in all his thoughts. He wants to get married, God is not in his thoughts. And he wants to progress, I want this, I want to grab that, I want to do this. God is not in all his thoughts. He has the sin of forgetting God. The sin of forgetting God. Whatever decision is going to take. He has a problem in the family and he says, I'm going to separate from the wife. I'm going to park away from the husband. God is not in his thoughts. I'm going to divorce my wife. I'm going to divorce the man. And then goes to the court and he do this and tear the family apart. Hi, but God, God is not, he's not involved with that. God is not in all his thoughts. As we forget God, as we don't think about God. And we claim we're Christians. We claim we're believers. We claim we're children of God. What's your foundation? If you say you're a child of God. What's your foundation? If you say you're a believer. What do you plan your life on? How do you run your life? How do you carry on your life? How do you make a decision? How do you move on in the ways and the things of the Lord? If God is not in all your thoughts, who is in your thoughts? And who is in your plan? And on what basis are you planning everything that you are doing? We need to ensure the protection we ought to have from damnable, regrettable forgetfulness. Look at some nine verse 17. Psalm 9 verse 17. The wicked shall be turned to hell, into hell and all the nations that forget God. Look at that. It bundles them together. How, how is it that a whole nation and many nations that forget God shall be turned into hell? You see, it depends on the attitude of the people who are leading that nation. And then they say what's important is economy. What's important is, uh, you know, commerce. What's important is how to make gain. What's important is this and that. They don't think about heaven. They don't think about the future. They don't think about righteousness. They don't think about where will the citizens spend eternity. 
all that many governments are concerned about is what is it today we need to do to preserve this and to preserve everything it's about the economy. And we forget God. And he says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. It tells us in Psalm 50 verse 22. Psalm 50, reading from verse 22. Now consider this. It says we need to consider and the Lord knows there are people that forget him. The people that do not think about who God is, what God wants, and what the final day of judgment will be. He knows there's a lot, a lot of people that live their lives without thinking about God. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Ye that forget God, lest when the judgment day will come, the word of judgment will tear you in pieces and throw you into hellfire, and there will be none to deliver. As we think about this to ensure the protection we should have, we must have from damnable, regrettable forgetfulness. The three things we're talking about. Number one, the inexcusable disposition of forgetting God. Just, that's the habit. That's the life. The disposition of forgetting God. Number two is the inescapable damnation for forgetting God. That if anybody forgets God... There's going to be a consequence on the final day. Uh, the people who concentrate all their lives, they concentrate all their thinking, they concentrate all their plan, and they concentrate all their pursuit on, I will make it, I must make it, success, and uh, development, and growth, and money, and business, and all that. And they don't think about their salvation. There's the inescapable damnation for forgetting God. Number three is the inestimable decision against forgetting God. The inestimable is the decision of great value, of the greatest value in your life. We're coming to number one, the inexcusable disposition of forgetting God. We're back to Psalm 10 and we're looking at verse 4. Psalm 10 verse 4, it says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Well, that forgetfulness of God is not excusable. He created you. He's the one that has control over your breath. And when he takes that breath away, you are gone. When you sleep at night, you don't know where you are. It's the one that watches over you. At the time you wake up, you just wake up, and then you are back to life again. It's the one that regulates your breathing. Your breathing. You breathe out, you breathe in to preserve life. He's the one that does all that. You don't have any excuse for getting God. It's the one that gives you the brain. It's the one that gives you the strength. It's the one that gives you the ability. It's the one that makes you whoever you are. What have you got that you have not received from the Lord? From your brain, your blood, your health, your strength, everything you've got, we don't have any excuse for forgetting God. The inexcusable disposition of forgetting God. Look at Psalm 50, I'm reading from verse 17. Psalm 50, reading from verse 17. It says, Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. Those are the people that forget God. They cast the word of God, the commandment of God, the desires of God, and they cast, they, they cast all that God demands. As they cast that behind them. In verse 18, it says, When thou sawest his seed, then thou contested with him, that he to agree with him, and has been partaker with adulterers. When you do that, of course, you're forgotten God. You're forgotten you know, the commandment of God. You are the one that will run errands for adulterers, to link up with adulterers. You are the one that will bring the prostitute unto your master and you're the one that will be running all that can errand and you only think I want to keep my job that's what madam wants that's what uh, my boss wants if I don't do it I might lose my job and you forget God you may not lose 
lose your job, you lose your soul. You may not lose your job, you lose the peace of God all throughout eternity. Look at verse 19. It says in verse 19, Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. In verse 20, it tells us, Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own brother's son. And then in verse 21, it tells us, so These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest, you thought that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now look at verse 22, the conclusion of all that is seen. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver the inexcusable disposition of forgetting God. And then let's come to and the second one now, the inescapable damnation, inescapable damnation for forgetting God. When eventually you come to the judgment seat and you appear before the judgment throne and you see the creator of heaven and earth and for the first time you are hearing about him because when you are here on earth you forgot his word. You forgot his worship. And you forgot his adoration. You forgot his assignment. You forgot what he wanted you to do. You just live your life as if there were no God. You are like a practical, practicing atheist. In theory, you say, I believe there is God. In theory, you say, I know there's a God in heaven. But the way you live your life, you are a practical atheist. You acted. You decided, you lived, you spoke, you did everything as if there were no God. Now, there's going to be a consequence of that. There's the inescapable damnation for forgetting God. You forget the law of God, you forget the word of God, you forget the demand of God, and you forget there's going to be a judgment day when God will be all in all, and he'll take the final decision upon your life. It's inescapable. The damnation of such a person. Come to Psalm 9 verse 17. In Psalm 9 verse 17, it says the wicked shall be turned into hell. At that time, there will be no argument. At that time, there will be no power. At that time, you'll be so paralyzed and you'll be so confused. What are you going to say? Would you say you didn't know there is God? You should have known the heavens declare his glory and all the things that have been declared that there is a creator. But because of your wickedness, that's why you forgot God. And it says the wicked shall be turned into hell. Every one of them, young and old, they'll be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God, all the nations that forget God. Look at Psalm 44, I'm reading from verse 20. Psalm 44, verse 20, if we have forgotten the name of our God, when we get sick, we forget the name of our God and we're running after idols and we're running after habalis and we're running after one papa somewhere. We're running after prophets. We're running after everyone. We don't think about God when we have a problem, when we're jobless and when we want to get married. We run here and there. We cannot talk to God, our creator, our redeemer. And it says, if we have forgotten the name of our God, or stretched out our hands to a strange God. Look at verse 21. It says in verse 21, Shall not God search this out? If we secretly go to Habalis, shall not God search this out? If we secretly go to uh, the traditional people, shall not God search this out? If while we're searching for success and searching for uh, promotion, searching for this and that, we're doing occultism uh, beneath, behind the screen uh, in the night, and then in the day we're saying, God, 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 if we have forgotten the name of our God, shall not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. He knows the secrets of the heart. He tells us in Psalm 106, and I'm reading from verse 13. Psalm 106, verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. There are people who are in such a hurry. I must get this now. 
I must get that now. And all the things they're looking for, they're not considering, does God want this for me? If he wants this for me, will he not give me at his own time? Will he not do it at his own time? They forgot the works of God. They forgot the words of God. They forgot the wonders of God. They waited not for his counsel. You wait. Are you in a hurry? I must have this now. I must have that now. Are you waiting for God? Are you waiting on God? Do you allow him to do what he will do at his own time? In his own way, as it pleases him? Are you the one calling Lord, Lord, Lord? And you never wait for God and you forget God. You only remember God. Maybe when we are singing congregational song, you remember God. When we, it's a day of worship, you remember God. But all the other hours of your life, all the other hours of the week, you live your life without waiting for his counsel. That's what he's saying. All such people will not escape the damnation of hell. Come back and return to the Lord. Anything you want to do, anywhere you want to go, any decision you want to take, you wait for the counsel of God. It tells us in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 23, we're looking at verse 33. It says, How ye serpents and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Judgment day is going to come. And when that judgment day comes, it will not just be for the young. It will not just be for the old. It will be for everyone. And that's why today you need to come back and remember God, your creator. And remember God, your redeemer. And remember God, your savior. And call upon him and be so intimately united with him uh, that you do not allow anything whatever to separate you again. Look at Revelation chapter 20. We're reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, reading from verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. In verse 12, look at verse 12 as it says, And I saw the dead, small and great. And I saw the dead, small and great. My young boy there, my young daughter there, don't be like the other children that will say, I'm still young, I'm going to sow my wild oats now. I'm going to do whatever I want to do now. Mommy has, uh, you know, lived her own life. And then she came to the Lord after, you know, doing all the wild things. Uh, Mommy used to tell us. And Daddy has, you know, done all his own things after doing all the bad, bad things. And then he now came to the Lord. My son, my daughter, you understand? That time, your father, your mother, your grandpa, your grandma, at that time they did those things long, long ago. Now the coming of the Lord is at the door. You don't have all that chance now. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. After that, I'll come back. There are people who are going to do that. They never came back. They had accidents. Their legs were broken. Their heads were smashed and shattered. All their bones, all their brains gushed out. They had no chance to come back. Don't say, I'll do whatever. This is the time and the day of salvation. You cannot forget God and go scot free. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And after, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And then in verse 13, it says in verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man. And they were judged every boy, and they were judged every girl, and they were judged every man, every woman, according to their works. You know, uh, there are people who serve the pastor. They are not serving God. 
if the, you know, when their pastors are around, they look straight, they look quiet, they look holy, and they look sanctimonious. But once the pastor is not there, it's like, uh, you know, those who are doing, uh, you know, the work outside, and when the supervisors are there, then they stand straight. When the supervisors are not there, they don't stand straight. Those people, are not, they are hypocrites, and the people who are doing whatever they want, they don't understand all their works are being recorded in the books of records, and they do whatever they want, and they are not thinking about God. It's only when, uh, you know, a pastor is around, it's only when a leader is around, then they shape up and they begin to do something as if they are righteous. All that is hypocrisy and deception. It says the final day of judgment will come and they were judged, everyone, according to their works. And then in verse 14, it says in verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What's the second death? Is the death of death. When we say X to the second degree, X squad. When we say A to the second degree, A squad, it is A of A. The death of death. That means death no more. Because now everybody will live forever, either in hell or in heaven. And it says in verse 15, in verse 15, and also ever was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. What should we do then? So we can escape that damnation of those who forget God. Number three, the inestimable decision against forgetting God. The inestimable decision against forgetting God. It means that you remember God, you are not going to forget God. Look at Psalm 20. Uh, is Psalm 20, I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 20, reading from verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember. We will remember. I will remember. In times of trial, I will remember. In times of promotion, I will remember. In times of pain, I will remember. In times of a crossroad in my life, in your life, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We will remember the name of the Lord our God. Look at verse 8. It says in verse 8, they are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and we stand up. It tells us in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Look at verse 6. It says in Psalm 119, verse 6, and we need to remember God. And we must not forget God. We must not be among the people. I am saved and so I can forget about that and forget about salvation and then go pursuing the world. It says in Psalm 119, verse 16. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 16. It's saying that whatever happens, I'm, going to, I'm not going to forget God. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. I will not forget thy word. It tells us in verse 61. In verse 61, it's still talking about remembering God. Whatever is happening, I will not forget the law of the Lord. The bands of wicked have robbed me, but... I have not forgotten thy law. When negative things happen, all those people wanting to forget God. What's the use in serving God? Look at what happened. I failed an exam. I missed this. I missed that opportunity. What's the use of serving God? I'm not married at this age. That's what the devil wants you to do. He doesn't only want you to, he doesn't want you to, to just to rob you of your substance. He wants to rob you of your salvation. But this man says, the bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. It says in verse 83, in verse 83, it says, I am become like a bottle in the smoke. You know, when you pass through the, a place where there's smoke, heavy smoke, you know what you breathe in, how you feel, and it says, I'm like a bottle in the smoke. Yet do I not forget thy statutes. I will not forget. In verse 93, in verse 93, he tells us again, he says, I will never forget thy precept. I will never forget that precept for with them that was quickened me. 
It says in verse 109, in verse 109, it says, my soul is continually in my hand. It says there's danger. It says uh, there's insecurity, but all the same, it says, I do not forget thy law. And then it says in verse 141, Psalm 141, here's what he tells us now. He says, I am small and despised. I am small and, and persecuted. I am belittled. I am put down. I am humiliated and despised. It says, all the same, yet do I not forget that precepts. That's the decision we ought to make. And that's the decision you ought to make, that you remember God all the time. If you have not been like that, now you must remember how you serve God, how you were saved, how you were sanctified, how you were committed, how you were consecrated unto the Lord. If you have blessed your false faith, if you have left your first love, if you have left your first commitment, if you have left your first consecration, if you have left your first concentration on God and you have forgotten God, the Lord is telling you to remember and come back today so that you will serve God acceptably and from now on. Any decision of your life, any direction of your life, any plan of your life, any pursuit of your life, you will remember what does God say, what does God want. It tells us Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 4. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You're not remembering him like you used to do. You're not planning with him like you used to do. You're not pursuing his glory like you used to do. It says, because of that, I have somewhat against you. Because thou hast left thy first love. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, remember, remember, remember when you go first got saved and remember anything you wanted to do, anything anybody invited you to, you say, I'll ask God. I want to know what God says. I will read the word of God. I will seek the solution, the answer from the word of God. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. I pray that total repentance and uh, acceptable repentance will be the Lord of everyone. And now as we live our lives, we'll remember the Lord. We'll have a disposition, an attitude, a habit, a heart that always remembers the Lord. And we will escape the damnation of the people that forget the Lord. We're coming to point number three now as we're living in the end of the, at the end of the time. We're looking at our end time pursuit without any distraction from ruinous flatterers. The people who ruin other people's lives by flattering them. They're so nice, they're so good, and it's all flattery. Look at Psalm 12, Psalm 12. We're looking from at verse 2. In Psalm 12, verse 2, they speak vanity, everyone, with his neighbor, with flattering leaves, and a double heart, do they speak? The people who flatter us, eh, they want to get something out of us. They want us to drop something. They want us to leave something. They want us to turn our back on the truth. They want to entice us. They want to deceive us. And they want to take the precious thing we have from our hands. That's why they flatter. It says we're flattering leaves. And with a double heart, do they speak? Look at verse 3. They say, verse 3, the Lord shall cut off. It says, the Lord shall cut off all flattering leaves and the tongue that speaketh proud things. In verse 4, these are the people who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. With our tongue, sugar-coated tongue will prevail. With our tongue, bitterness in the tongue we will prevail. With our tongue, violence in the tongue we will prevail. Our leaves are our own. Who is Lord over us? Look at some. 5 verse 9. In, in Psalm 5 verse 9, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. 
There is no faithfulness in their mouth. The people who flatter, there's no faithfulness in their mouth. There's no truthfulness in their mouth. They want to get something out of you. They want to take the precious thing you have, your ticket to heaven. They want you to drop that. That's why they flatter you. There's no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Beware of the flatterers. They flatter with their tongue. When a young man uh, sees a young lady and then flatters you, you are the most beautiful one on earth, you are this and that, is is getting at something, is getting at you. He wants to take your heart away from where your heart is. They flatter with their tongue. It tells us in Psalm 36, and reading from verse 1, Psalm 36, verse 1, the transgression of the wicked says, within my heart, there is no fear of God before his eyes. In verse 2, it says, in verse 2, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes. They flatter other people and they flatter themselves until his iniquities be found to be hateful. And then, in verse 3, it says, in verse 3, the words of his mouth are iniquity. And deceit, the flatterer, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He has led off to be wise. He has led off to, be, to do good. The one who flatters is not wise. The one who flatters, he knows what he's doing. He's a deceiver. He's not wise. He's not wise uh, to speak the truth. And there are three things we're looking at here. As we think about the end time pursuit of your life, the end-time pursuit of your Christian race without distracting ruinous flatteries. Number one, the danger of ensnaring flatteries. The danger of ensnaring flatteries. Uh, look at uh, Psalm 78. We're reading from verse 36. Psalm 78, reading from verse 36. You see, it says, nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongue. It's talking about the children of Israel. They lied unto God, and they flattered God. If people can flatter God and lie unto God, how about you, human being? They flatter you with their mouth, and they will lie unto you with their tongue. It says in verse 37, For their heart was not right with him. Anybody who flatters you, his heart is not right with you. He has something in the heart. And he's aiming at that thing. And all that flattery is just to get you down. For their heart is not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 7. And in verse 21. Proverbs chapter 7. We're looking at verse 21. In Proverbs chapter 7, verse 21, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield for the flattering of her leaves. She forced him. You know, during this time of pandemic and lockdown, and people, you know, somebody can begin to send a text to you. And then I just wanted to ask of you, I've been thinking of you. I couldn't eat without you. I couldn't sleep without you. In fact, when I remember uh, your stature and I remember your qualities, remember this and that, watch it, watch it. With her much fierce speech, she caused him to yield. I've been thinking of making to yield to sin and to surrender your life and then to go down the drain and to perish. With the flattering of her leaves, she forced him. And then maybe you first of all neglect that flattery. And then she sings again. You say, what is all this? This fellow is troubling me. Okay, let me just uh, reply so that she will stop, uh, you know, bugging me and pestering my life. Then you reply. She takes that reply. She, she calls you again and says, don't you appreciate, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, you are this and you are that. If nobody knows your quality, we know your quality. And eventually they force you into evil, into a covenant, into an agreement because of the flattery. I pray God will deliver you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 22. In verse 22 it says, He goeth 
after her straightway because of the flattery as an ox goeth to the slaughter as a fool to the correction of the stocks. It says in verse 23, in verse 23 it says until the dart, until the edat strikes through his liver as a bird he stays to the snare and, and, and knoweth not that it is for his life. That's it. It's for your life. And I pray you'll not lose your life to the slanderer and to the, the, to the flatterer. In Jesus' name, in verse 24, it says in verse 24, Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, boys and girls, O ye children, children of God, men and women, brothers and sisters, attend to the words of my mouth. In verse 25, it says in verse 25, let her not, let not thine heart in decline to her ways. Go not astray in her past. In verse 26, look at this, for she has cast down many wounded. Remember something? She has cast down many wounded. Remember Solomon? She has cast down many wounded. Remember all those people that were strong before, but now they're weakened and they do not have any backbone, any conscience anymore because they yielded to the flattering leaves of a man, of a woman. She has cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Look at this final thing, verse 27. This is, this is uh, something you need to think about. A house is the way to hell. A house is the way to hell. A house, a habitation, or the hotel room where she leads you to, or to the motel where, she, where he leads you to. That place is the way to hell going down to the chambers of death. There's danger in flattering. Look at number two now. The deception of enticing flatterers. The deception of enticing flatterers. We're looking at um, Psalm 5 and we're reading from verse 9. Psalm 5 verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulchre. They flatter with their tongues. And look at uh, Psalm 36, and I'm reading from verse 2. Psalm 36, verse 2, For he that for he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be, fit, to be hateful. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, the words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He has led up to be wise and to do good. And then in verse 4, it says in verse 4, He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. He eschews not evil. He avoideth not evil. He flees not from evil. He pursues evil. In Psalm 10, reading from verse 9. Psalm 10, reading from verse 9. He lies in wait secretly. The flatterer. As a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. The flatterer. He wants to catch the poor. The one who is poor in knowledge. The one who is poor in vigilance, the one who is poor in spirituality, the one who is poor in steadfastness, and the one who is poor in substance is lying in wage and he wants to use whatever bait the flat tree. He lies in way to catch the poor. He does, he does catch the poor when he draws him into his nature. That's what the flatterer wants to do. It tells us in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, he crouches, he humbles himself. The, the, the flatterer will humble himself. There are religious flatterers. They will flatter you and they will say, a deeper life, oh, you are higher than we are. You know more than we know. You, you, you are you know, students of the Bible, and then you are happy. And then they say, well, what can we say? Anything, I chip in, I just chip in, but I know you are a deeper life minister, deeper life member, and I cannot say anything before you. They humble themselves, and they are just to flatter you until you get into their net. It says, it's so that the poor may fall by his strong ones. It says in verse 11, in verse 11, he has said in his heart, God 
has forgotten. God is not overruling and God is not supervising. God is not seeing what we're doing, what we're saying. He hideth his face. He will never see it. That's, that's the deception of the flatterers. Actually, all the flatterers are the forerunners of the Antichrist. Note that all flatterers, especially religious flatterers, the people who will flatter you, know, you in religion, they are from the opposite side. They say, you know what? We are not Christians. We are not Bible believers. We are not Bible people. But you know, we respect you. We love you. We honor you. And we know, we know what you stand for. Don't think because we are not in church with you that we don't know your value. We don't know your honor. It's all flattery. It's all flattery. They want you because after they have flattered you, you cannot speak against them. After you have, they have flattered you, you cannot bring out their false doctrine and you cannot bring out their evil ways and you cannot bring out their dangerous, damnable, pernicious ways anymore. That's why they flatter. And the flatterers are the forerunners of the Antichrist. Look at what the Antichrist will do. We're looking at uh, Daniel chapter 11 verse 21. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 21 in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom but look at this. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That's the Antichrist, not the Antichrist. He will obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And flatteries today, denominational flatteries, religious flatteries, and all those uh, popular flatteries, they are Antichrist uh, forerunners, and they, they are running before the Antichrist, and they are taking the nature of the Antichrist. Beware, don't let anybody flatter you into false doctrine. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, there are some people, you're in deeper life, and you're having some time of discouragement. This is not working, this is not working. And when somebody yields to a uh, discouragement like that, you say, I don't think I want to go to, you know, church today, uh, but I'm still going to go somewhere. Then you go to another place and they spot you out. They say, that's a deeper life, man. That's a deeper life, a woman. After the service, they come to you and they say, welcome, we appreciate you. Are you not from deeper life? Yes, I am. Well, and you came here today, not accidentally. Actually, we have been praying that God will give us somebody who will lead us, who will teach us. And we know you have the word, but there are too many people in that deeper life. Why don't you come here? And as they flatter you, and they tell you that, you know, you came not by accident, then you stay there. All those forerunners of the Antichrist, they have caught you. I pray they'll never catch you in Jesus' name. I said they will not catch you in Jesus' name. Look at that, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he, the Antichrist, corrupt by flatteries. Corrupt by flatteries. Corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be stronger and do exploits. Look at verse 34. In verse 34, it says now, when they shall fall, they shall be holding up, they shall be hoping with a little help. But, 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 many shall cleave unto them with flatteries. You know, those who are watching this on the YouTube, they are watching this on the internet, they are searching for this and that. I'm looking for this topic, I'm looking for that topic. They've not got enough in deeper life where God has stationed them, where God has planted them. And then uh, they listen to that. They say, that's nothing. I'm going to visit them. And when you visit them, their sanctuaries, they hook you in and you cleave unto them because of their flattery. The Lord is warning us that flattery is dangerous, that flattery is deceptive. Now we're going to have discretion. Our discretion above, uh, above all the ensnaring flatteries. Our discretion. We're going to have discretion. You'll have discretion in Jesus' name. Discretion, that means that you think about your life 
and you think about what you ought to be and what you ought to do. And you have discretion above all the endangering flatteries. In Psalm 112, we're coming to verse 5. A good man showeth favor. A good man showeth favor and lendeth he will guide his affairs with discretion. That's what you ought to have discretion. You ought to be sensible. You ought to be reasonable. And you ought to watch against all those flatteries. It's telling us now in verse 6. It says in verse 6, Surely it shall not be more forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. It's as you keep to that foundation. And you keep away from flattery. And you keep away from all the danger and the deception of those flatterers that the Lord himself will keep you. You, and then it says in verse 7, it says in verse 7, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Look at this, look at this. His heart, he speaks, trust in the Lord. He's trusting in the Lord. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 2, and reading from verse 11. Proverbs chapter 2, we're reading from verse 11, it says, discretion shall preserve thee, while the flatterers are flattering, while the people that forget God, they're living their lives according to the pattern they want to live without remembering God, you will be discreet, you'll be diligent, you'll be watchful on the word of God, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, it tells us in verse 12, it says in verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man to deliver you from the way of the evil woman to deliver you from the way of the evil uh, uh, of the evil flatterer from the man that speaketh forward things. And then it says in verse 13, in verse 13, it says, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness. Look at verse 16 there. In verse 16, it says, to deliver thee from the strange woman. Those are the people and those are the ones, they flatter, they may be men, they may be women, they may be religious, and they may want to sell their flesh. They may, they may want to sell their body and they have to flatter you to get you into the pit of degradation and the word of God makes you discreet. The word of God makes you vigilant. The word of God makes you diligent. The word of God makes you devoted, consecrated uncompromisingly and it is that word that will deliver you from the strange woman even from the stranger which flattereth with her words the stranger which flattereth with her words and it says in verse 17 in verse 17 which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant the covenant of her God, forgetteth the covenant of her God. The Lord wants us to be diligent so that the flatterers will not get us, the flatterers will not catch us. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15, Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 15. He wants us, after he has reminded us that we shall follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. It says, looking diligently, lest any man and fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness, any root of selfishness, any root of sinfulness, any root of evil, any root of backsliding, any root of falling away from the faith, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. What are we to do now? Look at verse 28. In verse 28 it says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Those who are standing firm on the foundation and those who are standing firm on this indestructible foundation, those who are standing firm on this irreplaceable foundation, those who are standing firm on this redemptive, righteous, revealed foundation, we're going to receive the kingdom which cannot be moved. He says, let us have grace. We need grace. Grace for salvation. 
and grace for sanctification, grace for the power of God, grace for the peace of God to abide in us, and grace for the purity of heart, and grace for the power of God, and grace for the service of God. It says we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have the grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and with reverence and godly fear. That's what the Lord is calling us. The Lord is coming. And because of the challenge of the Lord coming, we need to abide in the truth, abide in the way, and abide in the word. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, and reading from verse 11, it says, See then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Now that we have seen uh, the foundation being eroded, we have seen the foundation being ruined, uh, we have seen the foundation being displaced, we have seen the foundation being destroyed, and he wants us to keep that foundation and keep to that foundation. And he tells us of the damnation, of the danger, of the deceitfulness of the people that are flattering, that are going to the right foundation, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought he to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Then in verse 12, it says in verse 12, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fire and heat. All the things people are gathering together today and then they are forsaking the foundation, they are forsaking salvation, they are forsaking holiness, they are forsaking the pursuit of the kingdom of God. It says all those things shall be melted away like elements. And then in verse 13, it says in verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Then in verse 14, it says in verse 14, wherefore, beloved seen, that ye look for such things, be diligent, that's our discretion, be diligent, that's our watchfulness, be diligent, that's what we're looking at. It says, be diligent, that ye will be found, may be found of him in peace, without sport and without blame, without sport and blameless, get saved and remain free from sin and be sanctified and be purified and be without sport, without wrinkle and without blame, waiting for the coming of the Lord because the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive shall be raised up together with them to be with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord and so shall you ever be with the Lord and so shall I ever be with the Lord and so shall the saints of God ever be with the Lord but make sure that the foundation still remains intact Make sure that you are not forgetting God and make sure you are not yielding to the force and to the pressure and to the sweetness of mouth of the flatterers. And God will keep you faithful until that final day in Jesus' name. We need to rise up now and pray unto the Lord. We need to rise up now and pray unto the, that the Lord himself, the Lord himself will keep us faithful. The Lord himself will help us so that all the things that are happening in these last days and days last time will not sweep us away from our ground where we stand. Tell the Lord, O oh Lord, I've seen that the foundation is very important. If the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? The foundation of my faith, the foundation of salvation, the foundation of sanctification, the foundation of power with God, the power of the Holy Ghost, and the foundation of the Word of God, not taking any jot away, not removing any title away from the Word of God. Lord, help me. As it has been delivered unto me, let me keep that Word and let me keep that foundation. Open your mouth, tell the Lord, tell the Lord, are you born again? Because except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Are you redeemed? Are you forgiven? Are you set free from your sin? And are you continuing in the world? Are you continuing in the world? You comprehend that redemptive foundation? 
and you consecrate with, um, that redemptive foundation and then you continue in that irreplaceable foundation, you will continue. He says to those who believe on him, he says, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You are saved, are you continuing? You are sanctified, are you continuing? You are filled with the Holy Ghost, are you continuing? You have conviction based on the foundation of the doctrines of the word of God, are you continuing? If ye continue in my word, then shall ye be my disciples indeed. And he says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And if the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Then you want to make sure you are not forgetting God. The people who get into life, life becomes a game. Life becomes a gamble. Or life becomes a pursuit for this, a pursuit for that. But you want to make sure you are not forgetting God. You want to avoid that disposition of forgetting God. You want to escape the danger of forgetting God. And you want to have the devotion on God, on the Word of God, so you don't forget God. Make up your mind, have a decision, invaluable decision, inestimable decision, priceless decision. I will not forget God. Come what may. And you want to run away from flatterers. Men, women, fleshly men, fleshly women want to satisfy their feeling, emotion, and they will con con concur many things. They will bring out many things to flatter you, make you fall, make you yield. Their smile, their utterances, or their religious flatterers, forerunners of the Antichrist. And they want to pull you down out of your watchfulness. And they want to flatter you into false doctrine, into error. You're saying, Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Help me, Lord, I will abide. And you want to have the discretion and the diligence that you focus your life on the word of God. You will not allow any flattery. You will not allow any kind of sweet mouth of an antichrist to sway you and to sweep you off your feet. You want to stand firm until the very end. You know what Jesus said? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And I pray you'll be the man, you'll be the woman, you'll be the believer, the boy, the girl that abides in the truth. And the flatterers will not sway you up, sweep you off your feet. You will stand. You will stand. In his grace, in his word, in his truth, in his power, you will stand. And your Christian faith will be the priority of your life. And you keep to that until the very end. May God give you the faith to remain. Christ said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth? Let him find faith in your heart. Devotion in your heart. Faith in your heart. Love in your heart. Consecration, steadfastness in your heart that will abide to the very end. God will help you. Want him to help. Make you stand. Make you stable until the end. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name. Thank you for reminding us of your word. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of the foundation, the foundation of our faith, the foundation of truth, the foundation of redemption and the foundation of the total revelation of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a deeper understanding, comprehension today. 
Thank you, Lord, because you have given us the commitment now. We're going to continue in this redemptive, irreplaceable, indestructible foundation. We'll base our lives, we'll base everything we do on the foundation of the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, Lord, we'll pray. We will never be guilty of forgetting you. At any crossroad, we'll not forget you. In times of trouble, danger, tribulation, in times of sickness, will not forget you. In times of joy, in times of wealth, in times of success, will not forget you. Lord, we know, according to your word, you all the nations that forget God they, and all the wicked, they'll be cast into hell. But Lord, we don't want to end in damnation. We want to end in heaven eventually. Therefore, Lord, we pray at every time, every crossroad, every time, make us to remember your truth and remember your word when temptations come when trials come we'll remember your word and stand firm in your word every moment until the end in jesus name we we'll pray lord as the flat has scattered all over the world, in every street, on the YouTube, in the, on the internet, everywhere, religious uh, flatterers and the uh, fleshly flatterers and the people that want to suck out uh, the, the good thing that we have. Oh Lord, we're praying that you will deliver us and keep us and protect us from all those flatterers, whether they are men or they are women, whether they are boys or they are girls, whether they are religious preachers or whoever they are, preserve us and protect us from all those flatterers trust in Jesus name give us the right decision help us go in the right direction and give us the right diligence and discretion to abide in your truth and abide in your word so that Lord your spirit will gird and guide us and protect us and preserve us from all these uh, flatterers of the last days in Jesus name we pray will not fall into the hands of the forerunners of the Antichrist and will not fall into the hands of the Antichrist himself Serve. Keep us, Lord. Keep every member of this church and everyone who has said this word and everyone that will still hear this word. Help us, Lord, to be vigilant. Help us to be watchful. Help us to be sober. And help us, Lord, to have all the grace we need and all the vigilance we need so that on that day we will not be found wanting in Jesus' name. So that when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise, and those who are still alive will be cut up, will be cut up with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord in Jesus' name. Lord, every day, every moment, keep us faithful. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. And we know that you are going to be faithful to your word as we remain steadfast in the faith in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.